Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Brandon Harrington, and I am the president of the Chicago Composers Orchestra Board. And I'm very happy to welcome you to this concert, Drawn Together Part Two, the concert where we have asked CCO musicians to make music in a rather different way. The musicians are using graphic animated scores that are provided by various artists. The musicians are asked to open their minds, use their imaginations, and make music as the score inspires them. There's no doubt that this year has been a very challenging one for the performing arts community. We have been forced to find new ways to try to bring music to our communities uh, in a digital format. While there can never be any substitute for live in-person performances of an orchestra, I'm certainly inspired by how performers and concert organizers have pushed the envelope to bring innovative digital formats to you in your home with regard to social distancing and to use existing technology to bring those concerts to you. It is within that vein that the CCO brings this concert to you and all of the concerts of our 10th anniversary season. Yes, this year marks 10 years of existence for the CCO, a fact that we are very proud of. And there is no way that would have been possible without your very generous support through the years. This year is certainly no exception. We rely on your support more than ever to make this concert and future programming possible. If you feel so moved to do so, please consider giving the amount of a CCO supporter ticket, which is sold typically at our in-person performances today at the link below, our website, chicagocomposersorchestra.org. A CCO supporter ticket is usually sold for $35, but any amount that you choose to give, big or small, will go a great way to helping us sustain our programming and continue bringing excellent concerts to you in person or digitally. With that, I welcome you to enjoy this program and I look forward to seeing you after the performance for a Q&A with some members of the Chicago Composers Orchestra. Thank you very much. Any of us who can make some really sort of static or atmospheric kinds of noises on I just like thought of curiosity, exploring, and research. Because it's so literal, maybe we could take out the pitch. I could even tune my violin down if we're sticking with the low register thing. A little bit flappy, but with really hyper expressive, like. <laughs> The actual image that I'm shooting 
that you see on the screen is my self making and leaving a mark on a sheet of paper. So that's uh, one you know, level of uh, creating a mark and then also thinking about right the mark that light leaves on this material um, on the celluloid actually. Um, and then to add a, three tiers uh, to that, we or I was um, scratching actually the emulsion off of the print itself, uh, which is the portion that you see now. So you see the white. And so that's another form of mark making uh, on the actual surface of the celluloid film. of motion, any type of uh, change of the shape, any type of change of color, those things can be all very good indicator. So I wanted to uh, emphasize those aspects, uh, not so much about it, but no, no moment to be just gone without any shift or change. So I try to implement a lot of changes uh, visually.
I guess when I think about scores, I think about like language or codes that's like very distilled. What does it mean for someone to respond to your work as low in pitch, but highly vibrated? I think that's like, that opens up a whole new space for me to think about my work, which is, I think, really amazing. what's called a photogram, which is um, using light to expose directly onto 16 millimeter film. So in the case of that, it's a mixture of sugar and sand sprinkled directly onto the, the film strip and then running a light across the film strip to expose it, developing it. In. And especially with Genesis, where you have these kind of um, spatialized marks also, spoke to me in the kind of, in the mode of musical notation, thinking about these quite experimental shorts, also um, being able to be read spatially and visually as opposed to interpreted and soundtracked. Knowing that the music would be, with some premeditation, improvised to it, that actually posed an interesting challenge because I wanted to leave space for improvisation. I just like bipolarity. I, I like things that are either you know directly related or completely opposite. Um, and time, as they say, is money. But sometimes you have more than one than you do the other. And at this moment, being a performer who's kind of furloughed from performance, um, I find myself with a lot more time than I do money. Definitely was a lot harder to do the stop motion with the two little watches than it was with the coinage. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the piece itself says that I have more time than money at the moment. <laughs> First step was training a neural network on various images associated with survival, the coronavirus, um, the disco ball, which is thinking about um, nightlife spaces, particularly queer nightlife spaces that are kind of in jeopardy, um, given the novel threat of the coronavirus, and then also these kind of exploding planets, these kind of fictional apocalyptic images. And so the neural network was trained on all of these images, about 6,000 images, and then imagines images itself. 
and then I took that, which is a video, and then printed the individual frames and then photogrammed those, exposed them back onto 60 millimeter. And then you have this medium, which I think also speaks to an idea of revival because as we know, with, digital, with the rise of digital video, these traditional filmmaking techniques are more and more kind of endangered. Strauss. I am a trumpet player and uh, I really enjoyed my participation with the Chicago Composers Orchestra in their collaboration of Drawn Together Part 2. Uh, an interesting trumpet technique that I'm using for this clip is called flutter tonguing and uh, uh, most brass players can do this. Uh, some other instrumentalists can as well and it's where we're moving our air very quickly and rolling our R's almost like Roberto and we get this response. And I have a very cool mute to go along with this clip as well. Everything that moves in the, that video was um, um, enacted by me. Like even with the lights moving um, and the hand and everything was me like gesturally um, creating it so yeah it's definitely very gestural
the the statement would be of this work that um, there's so much between w words. There's uh, that you you cannot you cannot say with words, and there's a lot of uh, hidden messages in gestures, the interaction, which uh, you know shows the, the the hands also moving towards you uh, towards and then coming back back again. It's, it's this kind of idea of a uh, play of talking about um, different aspects of uh, um, of a relationship I think of relationships you you have like interactions human interaction um, interaction between gender um, interaction between uh, borders also of the skin I, I try to work a lot with perception and you know scale and moments of surprise just thinking of mus of the music I wasn't thinking of how this music is gonna sound but I was trying to give a, a feeling or a mood um, and by introducing these moments of surprise and scale um, it would bring maybe different instruments or different tempos or I don't know I'm just, it's kind of intuitive for me to just start with a human form, but I also wanted to use this character to guide the music. Um, so to jump uh, from the introduction to the development to the end of the piece. And so that was kind of the, um, the guide for, you know, the musicians to follow. And it wasn't, it doesn't have a particular pattern, but it is what guides the piece from beginning to end. Thank you. 
Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Randall West. I'm the CCO Artistic Director. And we have uh, several of our musicians and artists joining us for a live Q&A. Uh, Brandon, uh, our board president, is going to say a couple words. Uh, yes, hello, everybody. I'm sorry about that. I was just playing our concert in another window, and there was a little bit of time warp happening there. Uh, very glad to have you all join us today. That really was an extraordinary concert, um, and I'm particularly proud of how we at the CCO have um, developed this format over the Drawn Together series. If you had joined us from the beginning, of Drawn Together, which uh, was launched last May, you'll uh, you'll definitely have a sense of how uh, these concerts evolved. Um, and I hope that the format is is um, sustained going forward. I think it's you know really promising format. We are going to turn over the conversation now to um, our music director Alan Tinkham, who's going to lead a conversation with. Uh, some of the musicians who you've heard today and some of the artists uh, who created the scores. Uh, before I turn it over to uh, him, uh, I ask again that you would consider making a contribution to our organization. If you liked what you saw today, if you are inspired by our work and our mission, your generous support goes a very long way uh, to helping us uh, sustain that mission and sustain that programming. Uh, please visit our website, chicagocomposersorchestra.org, and I'm sure that link will appear, appear in the chat or elsewhere, um, or connect with us on social media um, via Facebook or Instagram. Uh, and with that, I am happy to uh, welcome Alan Tinkham to the conversation. Randall, you're on mute. Sorry about that. I actually don't see Alan on here quite yet, so I'll get things kicked off. Um, okay. Add uh, folks to the stream here. Welcome, everyone. Hello. Hey, hey, Alan. Well, to start, I would like to introduce Alan Tinkham, our music director, who... Um, Randall, thank you so much. And Brandon, thank you. Thanks everyone for being here. Uh, thanks. Oops. Sorry about that, Alan. I think I kicked you off for a second. Can no, you hear me? Oh, now we can. Sorry. Okay, sorry about that. Randall, thank you so much. Thanks everyone for being here. I am, uh, be besides uh, trying to figure out how to navigate between uh, between our various windows here, I am blown away by what I just saw. I hope everyone else enjoyed this as much as I did because I am, uh, as I was in the spring when we did this, I, I am blown away by uh, the dualities of this, it is simultaneously strange and beautiful. It is profound and silly. It is simple and complex. And the idea that um, 
you know, from my memories of our meeting when we decided what were the elements we would choose to to tie our our mutual improvisations together. I, I am again blown away to hear how it came out because they were all so much fun. I could listen to the whole thing again right now. Um, we're not going to do that because we're going to chat a little bit. I might do that afterward. Um, at this point, I would like to introduce some of the musicians and composers we have joining us today. Uh, graphic score artists joining us include Diana Torres and Kyoto Aoki. Thank you so much for being here. And our musicians that we have today are Liam Jackson, bassoon, Emily Whitaker, horn, Lauren Hayes, harp, Akshat Jane, tuba, and Sarah Christensen, percussion. Now, um, there's with all of these pieces and and all of the various things you did in all these pieces, it, it's it's uh, hard to know where to begin. So I, I think let's just pick a musician and have you talk about uh, what you enjoyed about this project, what you felt watching it, and um, how you think this is all going. Why don't we start with Liam? Sure. Hi, everybody, and uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I think as I was watching the way that all of this got put together, my biggest reaction was how interesting it was that we had a single rehearsal conversation in order to sort of um, manage where the interpretations would go with our improvisations. And when I sat down to actually record this, um, I was just struck by the fact that it was great to have some constraints on what the improvisation would be, but ultimately I really wanted to make sure that as I watched the graphic score and played along that it was a true improvisation. And I think I got the opportunity to play the first time around for this. And I think the first time I tried to be extremely adherent to the constraints that we developed. And this time I felt a little bit more free. And I think that I got the sense that some of the other musicians felt the same way, that it was just sort of a true improvisation. And um, I really liked the way that it turned out. It, it felt very individual. I felt that it was extremely responsive to the graphic scores that we had. Um, especially with that last one, I just thought it was very interesting that everybody seemed really locked into what they saw in the graphic score. And so um, I got the chance to use some pretty cool techniques, some multiphonics and some flutter tonguing and things like that, as some other people did too. So I had a really great time and I'm uh, encouraged to see what everybody else has to say about their improvisations. Leon, thanks. And that's such a great point because um, there is a delicate balance that, that we try to strike here between uh, planning what we're going to do and, and, of course, the improv side. And it's very difficult to decide. It, I should say it's, it's difficult to decide on elements that we're all going to have in common without limiting the Im improvisational nature of this. And uh, I feel like we struck a pretty good balance, Liam. I'm glad to hear that you agree. Um, let's hear from Emily. How'd you feel? Hi, thank you. It felt amazing. I love this stuff so much and it's so great having one idea and saying this is what we're going to do. It's so simple and then everybody goes off with their own thoughts and improvises and then it comes together and it makes amazing music. Um, every piece was so different and I love that everyone makes each piece different, uses different techniques and each is so individual and every piece you feel something different. The visuals are so incredible. And as a musician, just watching the visuals and kind of narrowing in on something and kind of trying to make music off of that, it's, it's such a cool project. It was really, really great to watch. It's a great project. Thanks, Emily. And uh, we all did uh, do a certain amount of, uh, you know, um, more, um, I, I, the word is not non-standard, uh, the sort of uh, non-special effect playing that happens a lot, but there were a lot of special effects too. Do you want to talk about any of the uh, special effects you used? Yeah, on horn, uh, I I feel like I can do a lot. I don't <laughs> I feel like everybody has their instruments. They can do whatever they want. Um, some of the kind of standard techniques we can do is um, some stopped horn, and I throw my fist in the, the bell and it, it stops the sound and it creates kind of a, a muted sound. Um, I also did some flutter tonguing, which we heard from our trumpet player who talked about um, some flutter tonguing, rolling your R's into the instrument. 
And um, I also did some waves, trills, kind of lip trills on lower notes. And so I was able to bend notes really far when you get lower in the register. Um, and I also did a, a technique where I press the valves halfway and it creates kind of like a ooh sound. And it's it's not a clear horn sound in the center of the pitch. And that was heard in the last piece as well. And it gives it kind of like a wave and it makes it sound really eerie. Um, it's a very cool technique. That is great, Emily. And tell me one uh, quick thing I wanted to add on to that. when. When you chose to use these techniques, tell me something. Coming into this, did you have particular techniques in mind that you that you thought, uh, this is really cool, I want to show this to people, I'm going to find a place to use this, or did it purely come from the visual? You saw the you saw the score and said, oh my gosh, this needs this. That's a great question. I think I go back and forth on it, but some of the visuals, I just instantly was like, oh, I have to do this technique. For instance. Um, Stop Torn has such a unique sound to it that I saw a visual and I was like, that piece instantly I was doing Stop Torn and I just, I wanted to play around with that. Um, other times I wanted to um, do the half valve uh, technique. I think it's such a cool effect and I, I picked a piece to do it with and I followed the visuals to do it alongside with that. So I went back and forth, but that's a great question. Thanks, Emily. And uh, what about Lauren? What did you feel about all this? I think the biggest thing that struck me uh, was how differently I viewed the scores, watching them in this form versus when we were all initially watching them together before we put all these aspects together. And I think it really just exemplifies it's arguably been much longer now since all of us have played with an actual group of people but the magic that happens when you put so many different parts all together. Um, so I was really struck at how um, different parts of the scores jumped out at me and how it's very easy when we're recording on our own to only hear uh, the scores from our points of view and echoing what Emily said, um, just hearing different pieces of the scores and how other people viewed them. Um, similarly to Emily, I also was able to use a few extended techniques on the harp almost as a percussive instrument. Uh, in Price's work, The More Time Than Money, when I saw the coins, I initially had this thought that I could use coins on the harp. So I actually found some coins and used them to make a scraping sound on the metal string to make that sort of noise. And then also use the harp as more of a percussive instrument to knock on the soundboard, the wood part. Fabulous. Um, now, you know, I, I like that you use the word magical in describing this because I don't think that's at all hyperbolic. It's it's uh, hard to it's it, it's it's hard to really wrap your head around how long it has been since we have all played together uh, in in the old way, the way we did in the before times and. Uh, watching these videos, it, it's easy to forget how long it's been. On uh, What amazes me is that this came about from a short conversation deciding on uh, some element to unify. And what came out was, was often so incredibly cohesive. It sounded like someone had to have written it. So uh, thank you. Magical. I completely agree. Um, you know, we haven't spoken to any of our composers yet. How about Diana? What did you feel about all this? Well, I it was amazing. I was very excited to listen to um, my piece in particular. Um, and you guys were talking about improvisation and that's very interesting because the way I approached the animation was pretty much like that. It was very um, improvised. I just kind of started working on it and just let it go. Um, and uh, I don't know, I'm just amazed by the result. Thank you, Diana. And uh, Ayoki, anything you'd like to add? I mean, uh, Kyoto, excuse me. <laughs> sure. Um, well, I was actually quite lucky to be a musician uh, in one of your previous iterations of this program, I think back in June. Um, so I'm a taiko player 
and I played uh, Taiko and Suzumi then. Uh, and this time I had the pleasure of now sharing my visual uh, work. So it was really interesting to kind of be on the flip side of it. And um, both of my musical practice and my um, visual practice improvisation is a really important part of it, of my um, process and thinking process. So even in the film that I made, I'm, I was improvising for the most part um, in terms of the gestures, uh, besides having a general structure um, of the piece. And I thought that it was also lovely to see a more kind of formal interpretation, I think, of the piece. And I, I believe it was the harp that was following along the scratches. Um, and I thought that that was a um, very considered kind of visual cue also for the uh, audience who may not really understand perhaps that's actual scratch on the film, this kind of thing. So it was, Well, thank you was for your thank fabulous you. score, Diana. Same. Thank you both so much for your wonderful scores. And uh, there are a couple of musicians we have not spoken to yet. Sarah, our percussionist, she gets to do a lot of the fun stuff, right? She has all the fun toys. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you did? Um, sure. Um, I love how refreshing this project is, you know, um, during the pandemic, I think musicians are always just trying to find ways to make music. And for me, usually that's reading, you know, standard music on a page. Um, and for this, making music is less about reading music and more about um, observing these wonderful scores and um, trying to match sounds to them. Um, so I got, it's fun to be creative. I used um, some standard types of instruments. Um, I used a vibraphone for one piece. Um, I used a tambourine and a cowbell for another, and then I deviated and used some more um, non-standard percussion instruments. I used a slide whistle. Um, I used some homemade instruments, and I even got to use just some wine glasses filled with water. So all of this was um, just a lot of fun, a great way to discover new sounds for me and also find ways um, to bring the scores to life using my imagination. Thank you, Sarah. and. Uh... Akshat, not to leave you for last, but um, as the tubist, that tends to happen, I'm sure. And um, all right. it's okay. there was a lot of, you had some really fantastic stuff there. Tell us about some of what you did. I tried actively not to make traditional noises. I didn't try to like make any real tones or, or necessary <clears throat> melodies that, except for the, for the, for the piece where there was like a duet between violin and, and tuba that we decided on. Um, I love these projects because it, let, it lets me dive into the acoustic realm of my tuba when I'm not really playing it the right way. Um, so I get to make all the weird bad noises that all my teachers over the years told me not to. And so part of what of that part of that was like a lot of the other brass players, flutter tonguing, some lip bending, especially in the low register on the tuba. You can it's it's a complete ocean. I mean, it's you can just kind of play any notes or any kind of tones, especially in the pedal register, um, especially if you're half valving as well. But I also did a little bit of speaking, and speaking just kind of sounds muffled. I don't know how clear it'll come out here, but this is not too much sounds like when I'm speaking, parent. I tried to mic that as well. It was a fun project. I don't know. It was, it was very nice to be invited again to play that. That effect where you made the tuba sort of speak was just outstanding. It's one of my one of my favorite things on this whole uh, series of pieces. I, um, I this was so much fun. I hate to I hate to stop. I could talk about this all day, but um, I first want to say thank you so much to to the composers and the musicians who joined us live here today to talk about this. Thank you. I want to especially thank everyone online listening to this. I hope you enjoyed this. And uh, and and if you if you do feel it, consider making a donation because we would love to consider making we would love to continue making more and more products like this, more and more presentations like this, and uh, we can't do it without your support. So uh, thank you, of course, to Randall and to Brandon and to everyone else here today. Uh, thank you very much. See you soon. <laughs>